and now we'll have Lisa Durden talk about um, the fate and abundance of bacteria, pathogens, and antibiotic resistance. <coughs> I heard a lot of good things about the first Waste the Worth conference, and so I'm glad to be here as part of the second one. I'm going to just jump right in since we're short on time, um, building on the same themes that Dr. Brooks was talking about, um, but this time in a vegetative uh, treatment system, and specifically with cattle manure. Um, so in somewhat traditional systems, uh, when there is rainfall, the the runoff gets collected and stored in line basins, a fairly um, expensive undertaking. And I didn't... But there we go. So an alternative um, strategy is something called vegetative treatment systems. So in these, the runoff is applied to a field with plants growing, typically grasses. And uh, vegetative treatment systems version 1.0 classic were gravity fed. In this system, the field is right next to the feedlot. Um, at the University of Nebraska, there was a engineer, Chris Henry, he's now in Arkansas, and he decoupled the field from the feedlot by adding in this pump. So in these systems, uh, the runoff is collected in an unlined basin, and then can be pumped to a field that's in a remote site. So we have a lot of um, mid-sized producers uh, that were built their operations close to surface waters back when dilution was the solution to pollution. And um, this allows them an opportunity uh, to potentially have a manure management system that, is, uh, that works for them and is a little less expensive uh, than the traditional systems. And the uh, vegetative treatment system that I'll be talking about today um, has an earthen berm at the bottom of the vegetative treatment system. If you're running these things correctly, you do not have excess, w excess application coming off of the bottom. Um, with this design, it allows us to overapply if we want to be able to test the system um, without having to worry about contaminating surface waters. Okay, so our field is planted with cool season grasses that are harvested for hay, and that gives you kind of an idea of what the field looks like. And then this is an overhead shot of the particular vegetative treatment area where we collected our data. So to the right side of the tree line is the feedlot operation, four separate pens. Um, the runoff is collected at the bottom of the pens and there's a series of valves um, that allows the runoff to stay in the pens until the valves are opened. Once the valves are opened, it moves to the pump station and then can be applied at the top of the treatment cells. And uh, we like that there were eight treatment cells here because then we can do replicates. So I mentioned the berm at the bottom of the treatment cells. There are also earthen berms here between the cells. I'm going to show you data on the runoff that we collected and some soil data. So this is our runoff sampling scheme. We depended on the natural rain events. We were going to collect spring, summer, and fall um, rain data. Uh, we only got spring and summer during the years that we did this. We did not have a significant enough rainfall in the fall to actually apply. And then we collected three kinds of samples, and I'll, I'll talk about those and show you some pictures coming up. But the first is rainfall or clean water, so the rain falls on the grassy area, goes downstream, is caught by that berm, and that's what we sample. Uh, the second kind of sample was the actual feedlot runoff. Um, that came off of the feedlot and then was applied at the top of the cells, so what went on, and then the excess wastewater, which is what came off the bottom. And when you're running these properly, you don't have things coming off the bottom, but we were still able to measure. Um, this was part of a larger project that was also looking at this system for uh, measuring nutrients as well. And they travel a little differently than the microbes. This is a graphic of the experimental design uh, with our different rain events and some soil collection. I'm just going to focus in on one event. I picked this one randomly because it was in the middle. Uh, it rains. Um, we go there within 24 to 48 hours. The first thing is we collect that clean rainwater that's at the bottom of, of the berm. So this gives us an idea of after a period of time, after it's been sitting for a while, what gets released by the rain and what is held in the vegetative treatment system. After we collect that, we open the valves to drain the rainwater. We open the valves to get the um, uh, 
runoff flowing, and then we apply the run runoff to the first cell, and then after 10 minutes of it being applied, that's when we go in and collect our what's going on sample. So we give a little time for the pipes to clear. This is uh, no way for us to sterilize between our replicates, so it's uh, uh, not perfect that way, but we, we do what we can to uh, try to minimize those artifacts. Oh, and then when it reaches the bottom, it took about 45 minutes on average, a little more, a little less, depending on the year and the growth of the VTA. Um, uh, then collect it at the bottom, turn off in cell one and move to cell two, or whatever cell one. What is the N? Hmm? N equals 46. What's Oh, so during event six, we collected 46, I mean, during event six, we collected 46 samples. And that was on April 18th. Of the <laughs> <laughs> this is what it uh, looked like. There's that tree line that you saw in the diagram. Oh, yeah, that looks okay. And you can see here the, uh, uh, the collection of the rainwater the engineers put in systems to screen out the solids. This is a view from the top of the VTA um, where the material is applied and you're looking right down, here's a berm between two different cells. This is application of the runoff onto the cells. Some of you may know Crystal Powers who's here and involved in organizing the conference. Um, whenever I say we opened the valve, I'm really saying Crystal did it. Um, and that's Dan Miller, you might recognize him behind the producer Dave. And this is what the bottom of the VTA cells look like, that clean water. We also did soil sampling. Um, we did some over time. I'm not going to talk about those today. Um, we did some where we would collect cores in the fall. So they had, been, had application through the spring, through the summer. And then what are we seeing in the soil in the fall? We collected from four cells, five locations. And then we subsampled with depth. And here's a graphical representation of that. In addition to the treatment cell areas, we also collected samples on the berm to give us a kind of baseline data, something to compare our treatment cells to. A uh, picture of us taking the cores, and by us I mean Ryan, um, and uh, we went through a drought year where instead of the core going in, the truck went up. And then we called on um, Brian Woodbury, who's here at the meeting, an engineer out the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, and he brought in his special fancy geoprobe. So we did manage getting cores for that year, too, but it was a bit of a production. And then this is the realm that I'm uh, more comfortable in. Uh, we take all the samples back and do some micro. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the gory details, we quantified the fecal indicators. We did yes-no data on the pathogen, so each of our samples, uh, we tested if the pathogen was there, we could say yes or no. We couldn't tell you how much. Um, we looked at antibiotic resistance. So in this instance, it was plating on a uh, plate with and without antibiotics, uh, and then being able to quantify that. From those plates, we were able to pick isolates. Once we have an isolate, we can look a little closer and say, um, is there any multi-drug resistance in these isolates? And we can also characterize specific genes. We looked mainly at two different kinds of antibiotics, a tetracycline and a cephalosporin antibiotic, but I'm only going to talk about the tetracycline today. Ah, so finally the data. And some of that's, oh, good for some of you, and oh, now it's the boring part for others. Um, but starting with pathogens and indicators in the runoff and the soil. Um, this is data from 2010. Our data from 2011, 2012 looked very similar, except no salmonella in those two years. Uh, the solid lines are what went on. The striped lines are what came off. And so the theme that we see here is that um, what goes on is what comes off. So this is a little different than nutrients. If you're used to dealing with nutrients, you think of oh, a grass buffer strip um, reduces the nutrients. The pathogen stays suspended in that waterfront as it moves along. And so this is what we expected to see, and this is typical for any of the parameters that depend on measuring the bacteria itself, because the bacteria stay suspended. Um, when we go and look at those clean water samples, so what's possibly released after all this material has gone on 
um, to the treatment cell, we didn't see any pathogens. So they're either being degraded or they're being held tightly by the soil. In either case, um, from the data that we gathered over these three years, we're not seeing a, a risk of having the pathogens released into surface water if you're using the VTA properly to apply um, the feedlot runoff. In soil, um, our results mirror yours somewhat. This is what was in the, in the runoff, so what was applied in the liquid portion. But when we look in the soil in the fall, we're just not seeing the pathogens there. Um, they're mostly gone. And salmonella, our methods are fine. E. coli, if it's there, we would find it. Our, our, our methods are exceptionally sensitive. So um, I have exceptionally high confidence that, that this is an accurate re reflection of what's going on. Could you define human pathogens? I wouldn't expect human manures to end up in that system. So if you, when you say human, is yeah. Pathogens to humans. Pathogens to humans. So zoonotic pathogens. It's okay. like the E. coli. This is the bad E. coli. E. coli O and five seven H seven. So it's normal flora, more or less, for the animals, and it doesn't make them sick, but it makes the people sick. Moving into fecal indicators, and I'll move through these quick because we see. Um, the same story in all of them. With E. coli, the light green is our berm soil, so our semi-baseline data, and um, exceptionally low numbers. And for the most part, we're, seeing the same, we're not seeing any difference between the berm samples and the treatment cells. So where all that material was applied, we see about the same level of our target as where it was not applied. So again, this is over time. This is through the season. All these cores were taken in the fall. Um, Enterococcus, uh, different kind of indicator, same story. Total coliforms, different kind of indicator, same story. So um, regardless of which parameter you choose to measure, it looks like the VTA is, is effective at um, reducing the concentration of the pathogens in the treatment area to a level that is consistent with um, what happens to be there in the baseline. There's some total coliforms that are plant-associated, and that's why we think these numbers are higher. So summary, the fecal indicator number, <coughs> not significantly different, what goes on, what comes off, and we have no evidence that they're being enriched in the soil over time. So good news when we're looking at long-term sustainability of this system for these microbial parameters. Moving into antibiotic resistance. First, looking at uh, wastewater, so that runoff, uh, tetracycline resistance phenotype. Uh, there's a, a star there because as, uh, as we're starting to discuss more during these talks, there's so many different kinds of antibiotics. Uh, what does it mean when you say antibiotic resistance? And uh, so it means which antibiotic are you choosing and how do you define resistance? There is no standard way, especially for environmental isolates. So I chose to define that for this study as uh, bacteria that would grow on a McConkey plate with this level of tetracycline on it. So for whatever that's worth, that's how you can interpret these. Um, red is what went on, green is what came off, the same story. Um, we see the same things going on and off. The fact that uh, they are antibiotic resistance does not change their transport parameters. There aren't any, there isn't anything special. The antibiotic resistant bacteria when it comes to transport they're just the same as any other bacteria. Um, and we see the same trend with the clean water, um, that when you, when you come back at the end, uh, after a period of time, they're not being released. We know that they're going on, um, but after a period of time, we're just not seeing them there. We can look at isolates. These are all confirmed E. coli isolates. Um, and look at how many of them might carry multiple resistances. And uh, we test that with disdiffusion methods. Um, and these are results, if I pull it off of the plain plate or the plate with the antibiotic. So in general, if you pull it off of the antibiotic resistance plate, you have more isolates that have more types of resistance. Um, however, you also get multiply resistant um, isolates off of the plain plate as well. And our one with the highest is uh, off of a plain plate. 
My point here is as, as more of us start looking at antibiotic resistance in the environment, the story that comes out is going to depend a lot on the nitty gritty details of how we are isolating the bacteria. I could tell a different story here um, to people using these isolates versus these isolates. Uh, yeah, Terry. Question now or wait to the end? Hmm? Can I ask a question now or wait to the end? Ask now because there might not be time at the end. What percentage of your isolates, if you compare control plate to cat plates, were the temperatures? It was 50%. Could you, you say, say you played it on different conkeys uh -huh. to get a plate count for gray and tet. What was the difference between the two? Were most isolates tet resistance or did you go? Do you have to do a number? I don't know it in my head. Okay, we had a, I want to say we had quite a bit of tetracycline resistance, which is what you expect in this kind of system. Tetracycline is fairly, tetracycline resistance is fairly common. Our CEF numbers way low. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have that. I'll, I, I'll send you the, I'll email you the actual numbers. I want to say hi, but Hi, what does that mean? Yeah. I, what I really like about tetracycline resistance, uh, well, t a couple of things. A, I think it's going to be on the radar for people to measure whether they should measure it or not. I think it's what, I think it's what a lot of people are going to be measuring, not only in the scientific community, but in the regulatory community as well. So it's good for us to have a handle on tetracycline. It's also something that we have the tools to measure, and so it can kind of serve as a model for the ecology of resistance. Um, so that's my plug for tetracycline. I used to, I used to think, oh, why bother with tetracycline? It's irrelevant, but I've changed my opinion on that over time. Um, transport in the soil. Uh, we didn't find a lot of E. coli in the soil, so not a lot of resistance to report on, but the ones we found um, had some resistance. Not much of a, a story there. Not enough data to really say anything one way or the other. And then the final data slides are looking at the TET gene prevalence. Um, so we were interested, if we go, this is another question. There's, there's, I don't know how many, Maryland would know how many tetracycline resistance genes there are, 30 or something. How do you pick which one you're actually going to, to measure? Um, so we were going in just trying to get uh, oriented to which ones might be important for the system that we were working in. The winners here, the top three, L, B, and C um, for us. Uh, we were kind of ex expecting B, and uh, some people say M shows up a lot. Marilyn um, knows the ins and outs of these details. But for our system, this is what we saw. And then when I do the comparison on the isolates pulled off of the MAC plates versus the TMAC plates, Am I getting a different story? If I have to pick the same, if I have to pick top three, I get the same top three, L, B, and C. But you'll notice there's a significant difference here in the amount of TET B genes that we're finding on the isolates that were pulled off of the tetracycline plates. So there must be something about carrying the the TET B gene that uh, that uh, allows those E. coli to show up on our um, TMAC plates. So the summary here is uh, similar to what you saw before. What goes on is what comes off. Uh, we saw significantly more tetracycline uh, resistance in what was going on um, compared to what we saw um, when we waited over time in the clean water. Uh, what was coming off was much less. Oh, so I just contradicted myself. So coming off immediately, same. Coming off over time, less. And then, although the resistance was routinely detected, uh, the line here is we did not see it surviving or being enriched in the soil. So the soil is a great uh, remediator for these uh, types of things. Oh yeah, acknowledgments. Dan Miller was on this project. Um, Dan Snow um, helped, and uh, Chris Henry, who used to be at UNL, and some of these people uh, you might recognize as part of the conference here as well. That's it, thanks. Can I have one more? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, sorry, go ahead. Oh. oh, my question has to do with the bacteria, um, the survival of bacteria pathogens. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you did any research with saturated soils 
No, we haven't. Um, and I think that that would impact the survival rate. Certainly, we think, or I think, um, the fact that these get desiccated is a, is a big factor in the numbers that we see. It dries out. Yeah, it dries out. Yep. She didn't do it, and, and I promise I'm not a, I'm very practical in my research. It just you might think about sampling throughout those events instead of just taking a 10-minute sample. There's, there's just so many variability. Even if you sample the whole storm, you're really throwing in a whole other we did. input. Yeah. Of we did. They, we did, the, like, during the pumping of the treatment, we took uh, samples over that entire, entire time when we were applying the liquid and then it switched some, from cell to cell to cell. So there was some, there was some pooling of the, the liquid. So that's a good point. So yeah. Yeah, no. Well, you have to know where the sources of error are so that you know how to interpret the data or how you do it different the next time. So, very good. Thanks. <laughs>